えー、ただいまですね、えー、英国セインズベリー日本芸術研究所企画第5回石橋大山レクチャーシリーズ武士と弁慶そのものと戦さを開催させていただきます、えー、本日の流れでございますけれども、まあ、大会のご挨拶を頂戴した後ですね1個目にカール・フライデ先生の講演その後15分ほど休憩を入れまして第2個, 2個目のですね、ミカエル・アドルソン先生のお話を頂戴いたします。えー、続けて、えー、終わりましたら質疑応答ということにプラグラムがなっておりますけれども、えー、私の方からですね、国民大学に所属しております、ちょうどあの日本刀に変化する古代の刀の珍しいやつがありますので、えー、そのお話を交えて、日本刀化していくプロセスのようなものを少しお話しさせていただきたいというふうに。思っておりますその後、えー、お二人の先生方のご縁内容を含めまして、えー、フロアの方からですね、ご質問等をございましたら、えー、積極的にいいお話をしていただければというふうに、えー、思っておりますので、えー、何とぞご,ご協力の方よろしくお願いいたします。えー、それではですね、えー、まずはじめに、本学の赤井松久学長より挨拶をさせていただきます。よろしくお願いいたします。
it's going to be my great pleasure to introduce today, uh, today's speakers in a moment. But before I do so, I'd like to take a few moments to thank, on behalf of the Central Institute, uh, the Ishibashi Foundation. Because without the Ishibashi Foundation, it really would not be possible for these lectures to take place. And of course, this is the fifth Ishibashi Foundation lecture series. So thank you very much to the Ishibashi Foundation. I also want to uh, offer my sincere thanks to our hosts here at Kofu Kachuan University, in particular uh, uh, President Akei, uh, for being a very generous host and allow allowing us to, to make use of these wonderful facilities uh, for two lectures we're going to hear. I'd also like to thank the director of the University Museum, Director Sasu, and Professor Uchikawa, who's so kindly sharing today's event. As you just heard, the Century Institute does have a very special relationship with this wonderful university and with the museum within it. And so, again, it's a great honor to be here to continue to further that deep relationship. Now, over the past five years, the Ishibashi Foundation Lecture Series has become very much one of the flagship events for the Century Institute and one of the flagship events that we come here to host in Japan. It began in 2014 with talks on the interplay between art and craft in Japan, and also that interplay between art and craft in both the UK and Japan across our two countries. The lectures have explored a range of topics, including archaeology, gardens, and the culture of tea. And I think this wide range of themes is very indicative of the breadth of scholarship that's undertaken by the Sainsbury Institute. And it's very much the Institute's mission to foster research into all forms of Japanese arts and cultures, and also to bring aspects of science into that as well. And that's why I'm very proud to be chair of the Saints Institute. I'm now going to go on to introduce our two very distinguished speakers, and I'm very grateful to them both for traveling here to speak to us today. First, we'll hear from uh, Carl Friday. And professor Friday is uh, uh, a professor of the Graduate School of Humanities and Social Sciences at Safana University and a professor emeritus at the University of Georgia. He's a specialist in Haiyan and Kamakura periods and he's published widely uh, on pre modern Japanese history, beginning in 1992 with Hired Swords, the rise, of private warrior uh, the rise of private warrior power in early Japan. And most recently, he edited the Rutland Handbook of pre modern Japanese history. Then, after a short break, we'll hear from Mikhail Aldolfsson, uh, and he is the K. Dan Professor of Japanese Studies at the University of Cambridge. He's a broadly trained historian with a strong interest in medieval societies. He focuses on a wide variety of topics ranging from social structures, ideologies, religious institutions, legal history, historical documents, and international trade. And in addition, he has a strong interest in how historical narratives have been and are constructed both in the past and the present. He has many publications which include The Gates of Power, Monks, Courtiers, and warriors in pre-modern Japan, and the little losers, the high cave in action and memory. So it's my great pleasure again to be here, joining you today. Thank you all for coming, and I look forward to hearing these wonderful lectures. Thank you.
hope that we have something interesting for to say for most of you today. Um, so, I'll leave you. The Wishi, uh, or in more popular terms, the uh, uh, Sama are clearly one of the first things that people tend to think about when you look at Japan, one of the total symbols, I think. And swords are almost certainly the first thing that people think of when they think of uh, both in Japan and abroad when you think about samurai. The, the uh, swords, of course, came during the early modern period. Tokugawa period to identify it as the soul of the samurai, very famous expression. Um, this elegantly curved two handed sword that uh, is identified with the samurai was, in fact, born about the same time as the Ibushi uh, order itself. Um, the thing is that modern audiences are schooled on samurai movies uh, and such tend to envision battlefields looking a lot like that. The, uh, the idea of battles as melees of close quarter combat with uh, my warriors are going to play with us. But the truth of the matter is, they weren't. Uh, swords were never, ever a key battlefield armament in Japan. Uh, they were supplementary weapons, and sidearms in modern times. Uh, used mostly for things like street fights, duels, robberies, assassinations, other sorts of off-battlefield sort of contexts that used to operate off as weapons. But uh, on the battlefield, for all of the modern Japanese history, it was missile weapons, uh, arrows, rocks, and then later firearms that dominated uh, battles. Um, about this, of course, is that both scholars and popular audiences have been extremely reluctant to accept that reality. Uh, and they've been remarkably ingenious, I think. A lot of ingenuity applied to uh, trying to deny that, that, that issue and issue that and such. But basically what's happening here is that you're, they're confounding the symbolic importance of the sort. Uh, uh, and the symbolic importance of the sword of samurai identity with, with an actual practical uh, importance in warfare. So, what I want to do today then is look uh, a little more closely at the history of swords and their use in battle, and also the reasons, or actually their lack of use in battle, and the reasons for that. And also then a little bit at the efforts that the historians have made over the years to argue uh, uh, that, uh, in fact, they were used in battle. Um, now, in, uh, in Japan, as pretty much everywhere in the, uh, the pre-modern world, the sword has always had a uh, very special symbolic kind of identity. Um, Sir Richard Burton, the explorer, not the actor, uh, has a, a very interesting analysis of this. I think he's probably right. He points out swords are naturally a, a good symbol of warfare. They're, they're more adaptable and they're more subtle uh, and classy. <laughs> than axes or clubs. Uh, they're more easily carried both on or off the battlefield with long weapons, pull arms and spears and things like that. Yet, they're not as easily concealed as sneaky weapons like daggers and, and, uh, and knives and such. So, there's a sense of a sword somewhat more honorable than a shorter kind of knife. Um, and in fact, in Japan, swords achieved a, a, a very important status as heirlooms and symbols. Um, they were symbols of power, of war, of, uh, of military skill, of warrior identity, and all sorts of other things. Uh, you find swords as emblems of power, political and military, uh, going all the way back to the earliest myths in Japan. Uh, medieval warrior leaders like to present them as gifts and symbols of rank and commissions. And you appoint a general who hand them a sword and things. You find that uh, in documents of the of expressions like clash of swords and tachiichi, or to wield the sword, tachi uh, oskamai, as metaphors used for war or for combat in general, even though in fact swords were used. Um, not easy to trace the, history, the early history of, of swords. The, the history of this famous curved Japanese so called samurai sword. Uh, it's really the subject of quite a bit of debate and a lot of speculation, but there is a tremendous amount of consensus. The problem is that the evidence is rather incomplete and it's often even equivocated. Uh, the medieval 
the early medieval cash version of uh, 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 sorts that was the forerunner to the more recent economy, which I'll get into in just a second. Uh, clearly combined elements of several different types of earlier swords. The problem is that nobody is, is really sure exactly what the sequential relationship between these types of blades is. Uh, it seems to have changed and, and people argue about it. That, and that's a problem. And then it's, um, the problem is complicated by the fact that there's a dearth of surviving examples of swords from the early and middle of the Heian period. It makes it even more difficult to tell okay, what features were developed in and why. One of the most common um, ideas that gets tossed around about the origins of this curved sword, uh, particularly in, in popular histories and things, is the idea that it was a cavalry weapon. It was uh, developed out of straight swords because some are now fighting on horseback and, and you want to use the uh, curved swords to fight with the swords on horseback. And there's some logic to that. The, uh, the timing uh, of this curse of the Paris, for example, uh, coincides with the emergence of uh, the Samurai, because I'll come back to a second, or first and foremost, modern warriors. Um, curve blades do, in fact, uh, are very useful for um, enhancing cutting power. That's what you're after. The uh, curve blade tends to produce a nice smooth slicing cut, as opposed to a straight sword, trying to cut with it rather than stab. Um, it also distributes the impact more evenly along the blade so that both the blade is less likely to break and also less feedback into the, the, the user's arm and such, so it reduces shock. The offset hilt that you have on, on the early touch it was kind of an angle to the blade uh, also augments use of the sword one hand with your wrist. So it's logical. Um, so the theory then is, is that the straight blade of Kashi of the, of the modern period and the early hand period were obviously designed for infantry use uh, as thrusting weapons, but then the samurai, as the samurai version began to fight on horseback, they uh, wanted to do slashing and cutting type moves rather than stabbing, and so the curved sword introduced in response to this new style of fighting. Again, a very logical sort of picture, but there are a lot of problems with that. Um, first of all, uh, there was in fact, uh, no sudden change in the importance of mounted warriors coinciding with the emergence of the samurai or with the emergence of other swords. So, uh, in other words, both the straight from Chokuto to Tashi and the Nara period and the, uh, the curved Tashi of the Heian period were both weapons for mounted warriors. Uh, the, uh, uh, another interesting important point here is that the advantages of uh, the curve and the sword blade were obviously as much of as much as of as much advantage to uh, warriors on foot as they would have been on horseback. Cutting is cutting, so it really doesn't make that much difference. Um, and even more importantly, there's not a single example, not one, in any source written before the middle of, of the Kamakura period that shows somebody using a sword from horseback. It just doesn't happen. Uh, I mean, presumably it must have happened once in a while, but, it, but, it, it, uh, uh, but there's no record of it. So it certainly wasn't happening frequently. Um, and in Kamakura, warriors use their swords in civilian type settings, in street fights and things like that. Sometimes in battle, when they were unhorsed or otherwise forced to fight on foot, um, but virtually never for most back, apparently. And so the upshot here is that both the straight blades, the Chokuto, uh, and the curved Tashi were both weapons for swordsmen. They were, in other words, both were uh, cavalry men's weapons, uh, but neither were designed to be cavalry weapons per se. Uh, Heian warriors uh, also, of course, carried a second blade uh, at the time called the Katana. Uh, the Katana of early times uh, it was uh, equivalent to what in the uh, later medieval and in early modern periods, it's known as the wakizashi, and as a short blade, it's carried thrust through the belt. It was used for grappling and in close combat and various sorts, also for removing heads after battles. Uh, and then we get a new type of, of long sword appearing around the turn of the 12th century called the Fuchi Katana, or sometimes the Tsua Katana. Uh, and as those names suggest, it was simply uh, Katana with a Tsua, or sword guard, hand guard, uh, much like the, uh, the, the longer Tashi, and used primarily for cutting uh, rather than stabbing, as Tashi were also designed to do. 
but they were carried like a, uh, like a shorter kakana, that is thrust through the belt rather than on a sling carried at your side. Uh, they were also quite a bit longer than uh, the early kakana, but uh, uh, a few centimeters shorter than most tashi. Um, of course, again, we don't know exactly the origins of these things, but it's likely that they came into being primarily as a kind of poor man's tashi. They're cheaper to make. There are a couple of interesting sources that, that, that uh, list prices and, and, and sales that, that suggest that the Tashi is much more expensive. Um, the, uh, uh, you also see them in the sources being carried mostly by low ranking people uh, messengers and monks, low rank personnel attached to the various police agencies like the KB Show and things like that, uh, children, the uh, Shiga Taman as well. So, uh, from about the end of the 14th century, or more or less, Nishigatana began to replace uh, Tachi as the sort of preference carried by, uh, by Japanese warriors, both on and off the battlefield. Um, this chain might very well have been basically a bad convenience. Um, shorter weapon carried in the belt is simply more convenient to carry around uh, than a longer one carried on a sling. Uh, uh, it's a much more stable way to carry a, a weapon, much more convenient if you're carrying a sword in everyday clothing, uh, which we're just beginning to do more frequently at the end of the 13th century. Uh, and it also tends to uh, keep what's essentially a sidearm out of the way better in battle than having it on a sling to just get it as a ground as much. Uh, but in any case, the technology that created and defined the early Wushi, the early samurai, was not sword play, it was no archery. Uh, particularly uh, a, a, a rather interesting, peculiar form of light cavalry tactics. Um, warriors moving around one another uh, uh, in a way that always reminds me of World War I uh, aviators, dogfighting. Uh, horsemen uh, circling one another in small groups and shooting at them, as individuals or small groups shooting at one another. And it's very clear from the record here that, that uh, in that kind of fighting, actually, archery wasn't even the most important skill. It was actually fighting the horse scenario, which is another thing that reminds me of pilots fighting. It's more important that you keep the airplane in the air than it is that you can hit the target. But, um, the reason for that, as the slide suggests, is found in a rather interesting matrix of uh, social and political and strategic and technological factors that affected military decision making across the 8th to the 13th centuries. So let me go through some of them. Um, like the, uh, the Tang Chinese model on which uh, uh, it was based, the original UCDO, or Imperial State Military System, was a mixed weapons force. Uh, it was predominantly an infantry force drawn from present conscripts, uh, but then augmented by uh, heavily armored late cavalry. By the way, using that term late cavalry in the tactical sense, these did not necessarily light the armor, armed or armored, but rather using missile weapons rather than, than chop up seating weapons, physical weapons. But unlike their Tom uh, mentors, I guess, uh, Japanese cavalrymen were in fact a class apart from their foot soldier comrades. Uh, there are, of course, obvious logistical difficulties involved in trying to train a drafty, a conscript soldier to uh, fight from horseback, and especially when you're fighting from horseback with a bow and arrow. If you ever try shooting a bow and arrow while sitting on a horse, you know just how difficult that would be, and you put those two together, and it's even more difficult. Um, the uh, Japanese state very ingeniously overcame that difficulty by limiting the cavalry uh, units to men who came into the army with the ability to ride and shoot at the same time. Uh, people who acquired the basic skills of modern archery on their own. And the effect there is very similar to what you would have if uh, in a modern Air Force decided it's too expensive to train pilots in basic aviation, so we're only going to allow higher pilots who come in with basic aviation skills. You have to know how to fly a private plane, a private or something, and then we'll train you to fly, to fly warplanes, but uh, we're not going to teach you about basic, basic uh, pilotship. Um, you get exactly the same sort of a, a, a result from that. Then the pilots are only going to be middle class and wealthy people. Uh, and 
uh, the same thing happens in Japan. The uh, uh, capital is limited to uh, provincial elites uh, and, uh, and, and the wealthy, only people that, that have horses at home. Uh, they obviously don't want to ride and shoot, borrowing a rich neighbor's horse. Uh, and uh, horsemanship didn't, didn't really spread along the, the, or, uh, the, the general cultivating population until much, much later in Japanese history. Um, so, one possibly unintended result of this was that the Isidio system essentially institutionalized an image of mounted archery as the elite way to fight and the, the, the style of combat that should be favored by the elites. It mounted archery becomes the high rock way to fight. And so from the mid-8th century, the court then um, began restructuring its armed forces in response to changing military needs, and which by that point, uh, no longer centered on things that were really military so much as policing, uh, control of bandits and other kinds of police functions. And that called not for large infantry units that the, uh, uh, made up the bulk of the decidual military system, which was designed uh, primarily to, to ward off contribution from China. Um, we called instead for small, very mobile squads that could be assembled quickly and set off to, uh, to pursue raiding bandits. For the minimum of the way. And so the court begins from the, uh, the mid to late 700s onward, uh, focusing its attention on developing units of this sort. And with the result then, the, the prominence and tactical importance of modern archery expanded exponentially. And it was this process then that led to the emergence of Bushi. So, in other words, again, samurai come into being as modern archers, not as swordsmen. And they identify themselves by, uh, throughout the, uh, the early medieval period, at least, by, uh, as mounted archers. The terms like Kyuba Nomichi, the way of a horse and bow, or Kyusen uh, Nomichi, uh, sometimes Yuya Nomichi, the, the way of the bow and arrow. Um, you don't see the thinking of themselves as swordsmen until much, much later. Um, there are also, of course, a number of other things about the circumstances of warriors and the nature of warfare uh, during the hand period that served to reinforce this initial primacy of modern archery. Maybe the most important of, that of which was the uh, strategic and tactical demands of the period. Uh, 
strategic needs of uh, and tactical needs of the Ham period. So the period of the um, again, of course, the formative period for the summer. Uh, no foreign enemies. The uh, Japanese warriors mainly fighting one another. Uh, and campaigns were mainly about either tracking down lawbreakers, as commissioned uh, the agents of the state, or fighting over personal grudges. Uh, in either case, the uh, strategic focus of the campaign was always about an individual. It's about capturing or killing one person or one group of people. Never the control of territory. Uh, a warrior's control of land and title over lands at that period, the hand period was still very much subject to uh, confirmation and approval of central authority. Capture of land would have been about as almost as meaningless in the context of the hand period as it would be today. Now, my next door neighbor is about uh, 84. I'm pretty sure if I wanted to, I could take him. So if I wanted to, to take over his backyard, I don't think he could stop me himself. But it wouldn't do me any good, obviously, uh, because it doesn't, you know, uh, taking it away from him physically isn't the same thing as having the right to legally use it. And that's exactly true for the Hayon period as well. You simply can't uh, uh, capture land and, and hold it. So nobody tried. Uh, in that kind of context, then, uh, it, there are clear tactical advantages to missile cavalry. Uh, over the uh, uh, other options that would have been available to uh, uh, warriors in early medieval Japan. Um, infantry is not very useful if you're trying to chase somebody, to uh, run down an enemy who doesn't want to stand and fight. Um, the, uh, uh, it's also not very useful if you're the guy that's being chased or you're trying to run away. Uh, you're much better off on horseback. And of course, with enough room to maneuver, modern archers can almost always uh, defeat shot uh, cavalry or infantry in attack, and usually avoid being attacked by light infantry that is by falling on foot. Um, the uh, political structure and the composition of armies is another factor involved here that, that determines the tactical options available. Uh, Han and Kamakura uh, armies were temporary, irregular assemblages that were put together for the duration of those particular campaigns, mostly unable to uh, uh, train together then uh, extensively, and so they were not then responsive to large-scale command and control. Uh, commanders, when they needed to assemble the forces of faith, that they required through very interesting and convoluted, complex private military networks. Warriors were called up to teams, usually, not just as individuals that were brought with them, followers and allies, which is to say armies that were made up of smaller components, which were turn, in turn often made up of even smaller components. And these monadic organizations uh, did in fact live and train in close proximity to one another. So they were able to, uh, to fight and train together regularly and were in a position to cooperate and coordinate on the battlefield. So as a consequence, warriors of this period didn't attempt large-scale tactical maneuver they didn't fight as individuals either, which is another one of the images of the period. Uh, they tended instead to hang together as small teams uh, of varying numbers of makeup, again, much like what you see in World War I aerial combat. Uh, early medieval battles tended to be basically aggregates of smaller combats. The uh, melees of archery duels and brawls between small groups, uh, which were in turn punctuated by general advances and retreats, uh, and also by volleys of, of arrows Holding on foot, who could protect themselves behind portable shields. Um, this style of fighting is also perfectly suited to um, samurai tem temperament and to the uh, ego or glory demands uh, of a mercenary system. Uh, Mishi were privately equipped professionals. They uh, followed vocations that uh, were defined and further uh, skills were cultivated on their own, uh, using personal and family resources. Their careers depended on their reputations, which were built on uh, records of success and on individual prowess. So what happens here is that uh, warriors uh, were like modern professional basketball players, uh, better thought of as very talented individuals playing for a team, rather than uh, component parts of a team, which is to say, 
Um, you know, the, the first priority is me and my career, not so much the, the, the victory of the, of the, the team. And that's, that's a means to an end. Uh, the, the success of the team, of course, is always good for the players, um, but doing really, really well on your own, even if the team was, is still, uh, it's still a good idea, and, and you can bring rewards even in the face of team failure. So the modern archery tactics that are, that are developed by here and warriors uh, actually serve to uh, uh, give warriors maximum opportunities to showcase personal skills and personal resources, uh, individuals and small groups. Um, well, things begin to change, however, as you move into the, uh, the later comic book period, particularly into the uh, uh, Machu period and beyond. Um, the ongoing warfare that begins in the 14th century and the last for about three centuries, uh, fighting endemic uh, throughout most of the country and uh, over much of the span. Uh, this was, of course, cause and also catalyst for uh, broader institutional development, political and social evolution. Uh, it involved, among other things, an imperative on the part of emerging leaders, Diana and such, toward better and better ability to control and extract surplus production from the provinces. Uh, the goal being, of course, to be able to raise and equip and feed and transport and direct soldiers and, and armies. Um, and so armies that were fielded by these uh, dynamos, as they all emerged, were composed of increasingly by contingents of fighting men who were bound to their commanders by a defined standing obligations to service rather than short-term contractual promises of rewards as has been the norm in the hand period. Uh, among other things, this was the beginning of a transformation of Wuxi from warriors to soldiers, refocus their, refocusing their attention on exactly the opposite of what I was just talking about, contributing to the success of the group rather than concentrating on, on showing off as an individual. Um, these changes also enabled Daimyo to build uh, and maintain semi-permanent armies uh, that were potentially capable of functioning as cohesive units on the battlefield, which led in turn to an almost accidental discovery that well-disciplined infantrymen, infantrymen can actually stand their ground uh, quite well against mounted archers. And more importantly, I think, uh, a new political structure as it emerged involved brought with a shift in the purpose of war. For the first time in the history of the Samurai, uh, the primary strategic objective of warfare became not killing a particular individual, but rather the capture or defense of territory. And the changing goals and makeup then of late medieval armies together both demanded and made possible increasingly uh, disciplined group tactical maneuver, and also an enhanced role for infantry, which is uh, much better suited than cavalry is for holding ground. Horses simply won't stay put. Um, you've got, if you're on horseback, you pretty much need to be moving forward or back. Horses will stand in a line and be attacked. And so uh, if you want to hold ground, you really have to have infantry. And so from there on, gradually, uh, not so gradually actually, the role of horsemen and foot soldiers became reversed. Infantry formation serving as the mainstay of military forces, armored warriors increasingly relegated to supporting roles, initially to scouting and raiding, uh, raids on supply lines, things like that, uh, and then later by the time you get to the single over period, uh, functioning mainly as officers uh, directing uh, the uh, infantry, uh, not functioning as independent, as independent warriors at all, basically using force as a platform to get you up where your troops can see the way you can go that way. Uh, well, again, back to where I started here, uh, popular images of 16th century warfare, of course, have been reified by decades of summer movies and TV shows. Uh, and they always envision uh, gigantic battles on open plains where the opposing sides line up and then charge in, in disciplined ranks of both infantry and cavalry. Um, and the most dramatic uh, the versions of that, of course, is the Hyundai uh, Mishan movies of the scene at the of the battle. Get a cavalry warrior in uh, at Nagashino. Uh, 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 and then when they close, they gather up one another with swords and, and, uh, and other close range weapons. The problem is that research, not even recent scholarship anymore, this is already 20 or 30 year old scholarship coming on, uh, 
refused small schools like this uh, and indicates very clearly that missile weaponry dominated battles throughout the region. Swords never became a primary battlefield armament. They were always supplementary weapons. And again, scholars and uh, popular audiences have both been um, remarkably reluctant to, to accept that reality. Historians have been amazingly creative and dedicated in efforts to identify a point at which samurai shifted from being archers on horseback to swordsmen on foot. Uh, there are three hypotheses that primarily dominate that discussion, and none of them stands very well to what the street makes. Um, in the early 1960s, uh, Ishisa Sumo and a handful of others uh, began to argue that the Genpei War of the 1180s, the, the conflict that introduced the Shogun, uh, marked an important turning point in battlefield tactics. Uh, they were basing their analyses primarily on descriptions of battle in literary accounts like A.K. Mungakati, uh, and argued that while well, late 12th century warriors did continue to fight as individuals in the first step, they were no longer engaged in the kind of galloping archery duels uh, that their forebears had been preferred. And instead, they were now fighting at close range uh, with swords and even wrestling on the first step. Uh, and then uh, sometimes taking an opponent to the ground and, and finishing them off with, with a dagger of some sort. Uh, but as historians began to look both at more reliable sources and also to analyze sources that KK wanted to tell you more carefully, uh, they discovered that no, that's not quite right. Uh, tactics like swordplay and grappling from horseback might have occurred in some large battles, but they certainly did not replace modern archery as the main tactic. Um, one of the interesting things that comes out of looking more carefully at Hike is that, that uh, uh, all of the incidents that Ishii and his, uh, his fellows were saying about uh, warriors grappling or bashing each other with swords on horseback all occur at the very end of that, uh, at a point when uh, uh, presumably warriors draw their arrows. So if they heard it all, okay, I don't have any arrows left, so what do we do uh, at this point? Uh, the, uh, otherwise, uh, you can see this very clearly, so the warriors uh, simply did not use swords if they had a choice. Uh, basically, using swords only when they uh, couldn't use their bow, and not even doing that if they had a choice. Uh, Genpei and, and Kamakura warriors were still, by preference, and for very good reason, first and foremost warriors on horseback. Uh, the Asma Kagami, which is a particularly useful text for looking at some of this, because among other things, it's the Kamakura regime's didactic history of itself, and so he was expected not to cast his own warriors in bad light uh, um, when he describes what they're doing. But it makes this point very explicitly in an entry from 1180. It says, But well, Montano, Kage and his retainers camped in the hills north of Mount Fuji, rats gnawed on and ruined over a hundred of their bolsters. At this inopportune time, the enemy attacked. The bolstering severed Kage and his men on sheep and brandished their swords. But they could not thus contend against arrows and stones. Kagehisa cast away his pride and fled, fled like lightning. Again, this is Kamako Roshin describing his own man, so it certainly is not willing to put that in there. They thought this was a, a, a dishonorable or undesirable thing to do. And in fact, you can say that's very, that's very smart. Um, it's very clear when you look at, at a number of things and stuff in the sources that modern archers continue to take the forefront in Genpei war battles. Uh, and they also feature prominently in later conflicts, conflict, including the Ocean Campaign in the North, the Wada Rebellion, the Joki War, and other things. Now, none of that is really very surprising if you stop to think about it a little bit, particularly when you start to consider how poorly suited uh, Japanese swords and early armor were to uh, fighting with swords, particularly from horseback. Uh, to begin with, it would not have been any kind of easy job to get into sword range if your opponent has a bow, as we talked about before. Um, and cutting or stabbing through the very heavy Oi Roy armor that dominated the period with the little slender Tachi would have been very, very difficult as well. So would hitting an opponent hard enough to knock him off his horse uh, in any way. Uh, particularly given that Oyoi is not symmetrical and it's very loose, so it tends to move around and have swordsmen swinging back and forth trying to do what you see in the samurai movies would probably have his armor going one way while he's going the other and he's going to end up on his face. Uh, and of course, simply knocking the opponent off his horse or 
Well, when grabbing him, intentionally dragging him off his horse, uh, the way that she described it, uh, would not, uh, of course, have ended the, the fight. A uh, warrior would then have to jump off the horse himself and finish off the opponent with a sword or dagger. But if you think about doing that over and over and over again over the course of the battle that's going on for several hours, you're going to, to have to realize that the, the warrior wearing armor that just about doubles his body weight is going to get exhausted very, very, very quickly. And it would also, of course, give his horse a wonderful opportunity over and over again to run away, which converts him to a foot soldier for the rest of the battle. Uh, another issue here is the, the design of swords themselves. Um, Japanese swords are beautiful weapons, uh, and for uh, certain kinds of uses, they are to be wonderful, but they're not very sturdy. Uh, it's a slender blade. In particular, um, it's not a, a single piece with the, with the hilt, and, and blade are not a single piece. You've got a tongue that goes into a wooden hilt, otherwise hollow. Uh, and that puts a whole lot of leverage with um, the hilt, you know, basically the pond only goes part way down the length of, of the hilt. So you've got a lot of leverage and torque at the end of the sword, which makes the, the time very prone to break. Uh, a lot of people who uh, do sword history have cited uh, some very interesting statistics put together by a guy that you can see down here. Now, this is a kanji uh, who repairs swords uh, behind the battle history in China in World War II. Um, out of the 2,000 some blades that the uh, United States talks about working on, he reports that 60% of the, the damage that he had to deal with were problems with the Zuka. Uh, Zuka would just break, the wrapping would, would tear or, or unravel, the Meikuki peg that, that holds the, uh, uh, the hilt on the, uh, on the tongue would break. I've actually had that happen to me. I have a hole in the wall of an apartment that. Uh, uh, I rented when I was in graduate school, but, but fortunately there was somebody standing between me and, and the wall and the table. Uh, the Suba tends to, the, the, the hilt, or the standard tends to come loose. Uh, about 10% of, of the problems involved uh, broken scabbards or sign up. About 30% involving the blades themselves, usually bending or cracking. And interestingly, more often than not, from uh, training or, or uh, uh, test time rather than actually being um, another very interesting theory uh, contends that the change came in the late conflict period with exposure to Mongol tactics and military organization, which then led to a sea change in the mode of combat and in subsequent Japanese warfare. Uh, this has been argued by several prominent historians, including Sato Shinichi and Amina Yoshiko. Sato and Amina maintain that the, the modern professional warriors were superseded from about this point forward by mass infantry with white equipments. Um, they seem to have gotten ahead of themselves on that. We'll come back to that. Uh, the, the timing of that is actually much later. Um, the popular literature uh, on uh, military history uh, is even more interesting. It tends to equate the Mongol experience even more directly with uh, the development of swords and swordsmanship in battle. Uh, they tend to, uh, you often see people citing the, uh, the difficulty, or alleged difficulty of cutting through Mongol armor, uh, and uh, Japanese being impressed with Mongol use of uh, swords and organized group tactics and things. But if you look even for a few minutes seriously at the written records, there are things like the, the Moko Shudai picture scroll uh, from the period that the text warfare there, you see that the Japanese were fighting on horseback with bows and arrows. Uh, and it's also clear that Japanese warfare continued to center on the archers during the north and southern courts, courts and on the shores uh, of the 14th century. The uh, most compelling evidence on that point comes from analyses of statistics on wounds that are compiled from battle reports. Uh, Thomas Connell looked at uh, 1,302 such documents and cataloged 721 identifiable wounds. Of these, 73 percent were caused by arrows. Only 25 percent were the result of swords or other bladed weapon, uh, bladed weapons. Uh, fewer than two percent involved spears, which is what uh, uh, Sato uh, wanted to predict. Uh, Suzuki Shinya uh, did a slightly smaller study, uh, 175 such documents, found that 90 percent of the 554 identical identifiable casualties uh, from the, that you looked at came from missile weapons, mainly arrows, about 3% of them from rocks. Uh, 
was 8% caused by bladed weapons and 1% caused by spear. On the third study by Shakhtar Mitsukiro, it's much, much less extensive, only 30 battle reports, but still reporting 82% of wounds caused by arrows. So in other words, there was no 14th century military revolution. There were significant innovations in weaponry and in military organizations, but warriors didn't figure out how to exploit those immediately. Uh, strategic and tactical thinking continued to rely, and continued uh, to, to remain pretty much what it had been all the way along since the 8th century. And the reason for that has to do um, with, the, I think, with the continuity of the uh, political and legal paradigms that, that, that determined war. Uh, if you're interested, I can recommend a really good book on that. I'll show you a few in a minute. Um, if you want more detail. Uh, I think perhaps the most intriguing effort to introduce swords into battle links the uh, enhanced role for swords to the introduction of firearms. Uh, this is a thesis that has been advanced by Tony Naka Tango, uh, Imamura Yoshio, Nakabashi Shinji, and others. Mainly, the story is the martial art, the game stories. Um, the uh, uh, argument here is that firearms and made even the heaviest armors superfluous, which induced warriors to switch to lighter weight armors. Uh, which increased their speed and, and agility, um, but uh, also increased their vulnerable, uh, their vulnerability to the sword strikes. And guns were also part of this, as the guns were supposed to have induced the opposing armies to close as fast as possible, so they're not standing opposite sides of the field where you're being shot and you get inside that gun range, uh, which in combination with, with the increasingly large armies of the period that the battlefields became much more crowded, uh, forcing combatants to fight at closer range, and uh, uh, that also helps the appeal of swords over longer blade weapons like spears or naginata, which of course require a lot more space to, to use it effectively. Now, of course, there's a, a wonderful irony to the idea that the diffusion of modern of, of a modern foreign weapon like firearms could have led to uh, increased importance and use of an ancient Japanese weapon like the swords. And of course, uh, a thesis of this sort has a special appeal for uh, historians of martial art and aficionados of martial art, too. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, new scholarship on military history reviews all the premises. Uh, a revised view, uh, promulgated by Fujimoto, uh, Fujimoto Masayuki, uh, Nawa Yumio, Tsukishinya, uh, Iwagawa Takehisa, and a number of other scholars, points out that guns, in fact, did not actually revolutionize warfare in any meaningful way. Hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat with bladed weapons, or hakuheisen in Japanese, uh, did not play a, a pivotal role in any single of the battles. Uh, swords were rarely the weapon of choice, even when warriors found themselves face-to-face -face in hand-to-hand -hand combat. There are some really interesting documents that, that uh, where you say, you know, we realized all we had was swords, the enemy had spears, so we ran away. And these are, these are listed in, in petitions for reward. So, again, uh, if this was not something that, that would have annoyed the security, you wouldn't tell them. Uh, it seems it's pretty clear. Uh, once again, some of the most compelling evidence, though, is comes from statistics uh, on compiled from the report. Suzuki found that of 620 battle wounds recorded documents that he examined for the period of 1501 to 1560, that is, before the introduction of firearms, 380 were caused by arrows, 133 were by spears, uh, 100 were by, uh, by stones, and only 21 were caused by swords. For the period of 1563 to 1600, in other words, after the diffusion of firearms, out of 584 casualties, they break down to 263 gunshot victims, 126 men wounded by arrows, 99 wounded by spears, 40 victims of sword wounds or cutting uh, injuries, and key keys of, uh, 30 men who were struck by rocks, uh, 26 troops were injured by combinations of the above, including one poor guy who had a really bad day and managed to get shot by both bullets and arrows and stabbed with a spear. Um, but he lived through it. I guess it's, it could have been worse. Um, similarly, Thomas Conlon analyzed 1,291 casualty reports from the 15th to 16th centuries and discovered that uh, uh, out of those 179 deaths for which no cause was reported, uh, 439 arrow wounds, 343 gunshot wounds, 192 spear wounds, 79 
injuries by uh, uh, stones and 50 sword cuts. In other words, both studies roughly agree that missile weapons, uh, bullets, arrows, and rocks, accounted for about 75% of the casualties reported in the pre firearm era, uh, and 73% casualties occurring after the popularization of guns. Sword wounds, by contrast, amounted to just 5% of the casualties from both periods. Another interesting place to look for information on, on, on this uh, problem is uh, those texts that are written by uh, Tokugawa Tree uh, Military Science Schools, Kumbaku Schools. Uh, none of these ignore the sword entirely, but none of them pay much attention to it either. But clearly, uh, those of the scholars are not thinking in terms of a sword use either. And in fact, hand-to-hand -hand combat, and Hakuhisen itself, was a very, very small part of uh, combat and had very, very little effect on, on the outcome. Focus of tactical weapon uh, thinking, rather, was always on this level. When um, such local warriors did have to fight at close range, they much preferred to use spears. There's simply no uh, evidence that, uh, that there were large numbers of medieval warriors late or otherwise uh, who felt that they were well armed with just a sword. It was always a tactical weapon. Uh, there are, again, numerous examples and sources of uh, troops armed only with swords saying, no, I'm leaving. Uh, but there are no examples of warriors bragging uh, about who were armed only with swords when we decided to stay and make the stand, unless, of course, they had no choice in extreme desperation. So, to wrap this up, because I'm running out of time here, um, the modern image of uh, Samurai warfare for any period is, tends to be one battle centered on uh, sword fights. Battles tend to be thought of as collections of individual sword fights, but this is actually a phantom image that really isn't all that old. At best, it goes back really to the, to the Edo period. And the prominence of the sword is in part probably a, a, a product of fading memories of actual battles, and you know, generations into things. The fact that swords were the uh, defining weapon for samurai status during the period, uh, the badge of rank and such, also of course the weapons that the samurai are going to be using in, in duels and, and civil disturbances and things, assassinations and such. So uh, we begin to, to think maybe we use them on the battlefield as well. Uh, this Hakko Heisen image actually was very interestingly dramatically expanded during the Meiji period uh, by Imperial Army historians who look over, among other things, uh, trying to create an ideology of a uh, 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 Japanese history of hand-to-hand -hand fighting that, that uh, will part of that very famous effort to say that, that Westerners have technology, but we're tougher. We have uh, the Manishi and that has spirit, and that will overcome. Uh, we have all this experience with weighted weapons. Which, of course, is actually a little strange, because you can figure this really is that, that uh, uh, Western uh, knights and such also fall with weighted weapons, but that aside. Um, the reality is the principal weapons of uh, classical and, and uh, medieval uh, machine were in fact most and guns. Suggestions for further reading? Thank you very much. え、ユニアの中心とした兵法、そして